warm welcoming you back to this program, Think Tech Hawaii's Humane, Humane Architecture. This happening to be the 341st uh, episode already, and you're going to be the 19,359th or so viewer, which we appreciate a lot, which for architecture is a lot, because architecture is usually not the thing that gets people most excited about. And we want to talk about how architecture uh, has always been and should be reconsidered as an embodiment of democracy. And with that, who's better to talk about politics as our founding uncle and producer, everything embodied in one personality, Jay Fidel. Welcome back to the show, Jay. Nice to see you, Martin. <laughs> All right, so first slide here, we see at the top left uh, what we hopefully all saw, which is the debate, the presidential uh, candidates debate a couple days ago. But it was in this dark room. In the last show, Jay, and we will continue to talk about that, is the Agora. So it's public spaces and places that facilitate, facilitate uh, democratic discourses. So this certainly was one, but... The space was rather sort of nondescript and anonymous. And the question is that probably no one asked, and that's why we are raising it. In which building was it actually? And that one we see here at the very uh, at the very bottom, which is the, of course, the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. But that's mostly, you know, people didn't hear more and maybe didn't want to know more. So we add this here. It was from 2003, and it was by the firm Pay, Cop, Freed, and Partners. And you guys might say, well, who is that? Well, here a little bit of a remembering here for, for you, Jay, because this is the time when you came to this island here in the mid 50s. Um, I am Pei was a very young architect and he uh, was um, on a short list for um, the presidential library of uh, John F. Kennedy, who had unfortunately been assassinated shortly before that. And so um, there were all these hotshots. We list them down there. You know, there was Lou Kahn, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Alva Otto, and uh, Paul Rudolph, Philip Johnson, you know, all these hotshots. And she went for this young, you know, unknown guy that she, when you read about it, uh, fell for him, not literally, but figuratively because he reminded her of her husband as being so young and energetic and so optimistic, uh, you know, and that's what she did. And she did not even lose faith in it when, for example, the project that you see on the left, which, by the way, doesn't it look like Lada or Kaka'ako Towers, uh, Jay, but this is in Boston, Massachusetts, where it actually gets cold, so this building makes more sense there, because you might get some solar gain in the winter time. This is the Hancock Tower. You know, he was young and energetic, but with young and energetic goes, you're crazy and you're trying things out, right? This building uh, was uh, quite challenging because uh, Americans had just invented structural glazing where you glue glass to buildings and that wasn't quite figured out. So several of these fell off the building and the building was also kind of shaking in the wind. So it actually took, from uh, you know the the mid 60s when you came here and until the late 70s to be finally be completed as it was with the presidential library that was uh, again again uh, started to be a project in the mid 60s and then it was dragging along and dragging along um, and finally becoming so there's what we try to want to say Jay there are these stories behind buildings of people. And they're deeply embedded in uh, one of the words you uh, basically imported from my native language, which is just zeitgeist, right? Zeitgeist is life, is real people. And so we can do this, and I encourage the emerging generation to do that, to put things in the context of zeitgeist, because that explains why do people do things. And you were just doing the movie review about Reagan, the movie, together with your buddies up there, show quote. And the question was, OK, why does one do the movie right now? Is this a propaganda, you know, in one way or the other? And that was up for debate. It was an interesting discussion. But I want to move me over here because I had put you down there with the years of the 80s when Reagan was running. 
and you must have been in your 40s, if I'm correct, right? I'm up there with the numbers. I was like uh, deeply into being a teenager. So we just said this show is going to be a little controversial because we might argue we're going to have a decent uh, and, and, and dignity discourse about, um, you know, people. Because behind these people, behind these politicians, uh, is, is embodied energy of of value systems that we, you know, um, have different takes on. So I will provoke you now with Reagan uh, in saying he was the one who is behind, and I not mean directly, but indirectly behind Kaka'ako and these towers that are all hermetic, and I call them fossil formalism, because of what the Star Advertiser was digging out here back in the day in 59, because he came with his buddies from General Electric and they were promoting air conditioning. But you said on one of the recent shows, Jay, we're in Hawaii, we're so special because we got that trade wind air conditioning. So how about that General Electric air conditioning, right, versus our trade wind air conditioning? Was that enough provocation already, Jay? Well, let me, let me tell you what I've been thinking about lately, Martin. My, my first thought, and I actually made a, a commentary movie about this, which is on our website and our uh, YouTube channel about um, DNA. I'll, I'll hook this up in a minute. And, um, you know, you think of your own family and maybe you can get back a, 100, 150 years, maybe if you're really lucky, 200 years. Some people can get back further than that, but, you know, it's not too much more than 200 years. But in fact, you're carrying around DNA that was in the caves. You, you're carrying... Mm, around DNA that was when people were essentially Neanderthal. And, and, and really the question is, uh, are they your relatives? Do you care about them? Do you think that maybe they have some influence on your characteristics, your essence, your life, your way of doing things? And the answer is yes, of course. They're your, they're your ancestors. And I think we all have to look back that way um, to see DNA is more than this, you know, technological miracle that we see on on television shows and websites about how you can connect up with your relatives back, you know, two or three generations. Um, the fact is that we're all human, and we have human ancestors that go back hundreds of thousands of years. And even if you went back that far, um, what about a hundred thousand years before then? You know, so <clears throat> we're all connected. And I and I think that that is the some comfort in, in seeing it that way, because it means that you and me, we're related. Uh, I'm even related to Vladimir Putin. I'm related to Xi Jinping. I'm related to everyone. We're all related. So <clears throat> I want to transmute that idea into what you call zeitgeist. OK, zeitgeist is a kind of snapshot, isn't it? It's a snapshot in time. You try to figure out you know, what the culture was, what the mm, public interest was at a given moment. But it didn't come from nowhere. It didn't magically appear. It is also the product of what I would call cultural DNA, um, where it has a million strands from a million sources, and it comes together in a moment, and then it unravels into another moment. And so I think we have to see the zeitgeist as a combination of factors, a combination of DNA cultural strands. Don't you agree, Martin? Absolutely. And again, decoding the, the terminology of the word zeitgeist. So geist is a ghost, but in best case, it's not one that haunts you because the better translation is actually the spirit, the spirit of the time. And there is something to say you're you know, you're, you're mean-spirited or you're well-spirited. And that depends on how you look at things. And when we're talking about ourselves here, we just want to make sure you, the audience, understand it's not about us. But as you just said, Jay, please look back at your own ancestry, look back at your own genetic code. I mean, this is a political show in architecture. So when Trump was calling us Germans out twice, in the presidential debate and saying, you guys got off nuclear power only to trying to get on renewable and not being able to do it. Um, some Germans like me could say, don't you even remember like 
few generations back when half of you or guys were Germans too. And in terms of immigration, you can certainly take that position that you are taking is like, okay, like the Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, these are only the criminals who come. Well, then all America is criminal to begin with because otherwise all these people would have stayed where they come from, right? Or we take the position that we like more is like, maybe these were people, and this is something Kamala uses as a, as a term, opportunity, opportunity economy. Maybe these were people who were looking for an opportunity to actually become something even better than they already were back home. And architecturally, in fact, we will get to this in the show when we get going. That is actually the case how I see it. So this year, Next to me is someone who stands at the Munich airport, and the airport is named after him, as our airport is, is, is named after Inui. And, and this is Franz Josef Strauss. I don't know if you remember him. He was only a governor of Bavaria, but he was uh, my, my, um, my, my god's uh, uh, grandfather's favorite politician. And I was young. He was very, very sort of... Um, and say, yeah, reactionary, very conservative to say the least. And I could not understand why my, uh, my god grandfather was so into him. And at the top right, we have a contemporary of you, uh, a fellow octogenarian, our best architect on the island, Ron Lindgren, uh, judging on the house that my father was able to build for his stepfather, obviously arguing over you know, values and traditions because my father is a modern architect and what the, the spirit of this one was, was more traditional. So there was some arguing going on. Also being political, uh, Jay, uh, architects are usually not because they're afraid of, they're not getting commissions. If they're in one party, right, they're cutting themselves short on, that's why they're very opportunistically mostly. My father, I was raised by my dear father also in, in a way that he was not taking uh, uh, you know, sides for political parties, but it wasn't because of cowardiness, but of the opposite. This year is recalling when he had his Thursday uh, meeting with his buddies from school, they were going to this restaurant. On the table next to him uh, came always at the same time, at that time, governor, later Bundeskanzler, President Gerhard Schröder, that uh, my father has always stayed away from other you know architects came and wanted to you know have dinner with him and lunch and you know cut deals and stuff like that my father must have had a really good sense because schroeder when he was stepping down as a president what he said is i want to now get rich and how do i do this i buddy up with putin and I become like a like a CEO in Gazprom. So, you know, good sixth sense. It takes, you know, it takes some statue. So thank you, Dad, for having had that integrity to say, I don't need these jobs from such a guy. You know, he had the, the, a good gut feeling uh, to begin with, Jay. So um, when I went to the US first, this is the left column when we both still had hair. Um, I've seen pictures of you, you know, when you had more hair than now, and I certainly had more. <laughs> so when I went to the U.S. in 1991, my classmates were saying, how can you go to such a country that is run by someone like Bush? Well, then I came back in 2005, and there we went again. I ended up with the other Bush. And my buddies equally saying, you know, I would I would not do that. I basically said I go anyways, or because because I believe in this country, and why I will tell you in the next slides, because I already maybe I didn't see it because at the top left, where did I pose? Of course, in front in front of Guggenheim by Frank Lloyd Wright, because I was told this is one of the marvels of architecture. Upon further education, Jay, and this is why we do this program here, I should have been posing in front of what you see as these ghosted drawings in the middle. That is Frank Lloyd Wright's solar hemicycle in Madison, Wisconsin from, nine, from the late 40s. That is a passive solar building, a, a, a non-fossil, a post-fossil, a decarbonized, whatever you want to call it. We should have remembered, or we should remember Frank Lloyd Wright for that, 
and not for like falling water, which is which is a, a McMansion in his way, right? It's a beautiful one, but as far as the challenges of the times that we're having here, and I have to, so this does not get understood the wrong way with all the shootings we have going on at the top ride as my students in Nebraska, when I came back, they thought, you know, they depict me as a man in black because architects like to wear that. And I did at that time. Makes also thermal sense, right, in, in Nebraska, where you want to soak up the heat in that totally brutal winter. But they did a revision of that because I asked them to take the gun away and they replaced it with a high rise as what we're holding in our hands. Anyways, so this is, again, how do political leaderships you know, um, shape people's life on a daily basis and what are the values? And I feel we discussed this before the show, Jay. I think Americans, and I've been one on top of my German citizenship since 2016. So we Americans don't even see our own silverware because people, when they think about Frank Lloyd Wright, all they know is, and we are to blame as architectural educators, right? We should rewrite history or at least, you know, show the other side of history as well and saying, wait a minute, maybe you remember this guy, maybe not for the wrong reason, but for only one reason. So, but now we go to where the, how the show is titled slowly but surely. This is, this is the 70s. So I put our, our zeitgeist number is down there. So J, J, is, J is for you, J. You were in your 30s. I was basically in my tweens. And to for the young people here, although this is probably now already outdated, there is this you know, TV series, Stranger Things. That actually was depicted to be in the early 80s. So that's as close as it gets to basically say how these times were. And we did the show quote here. And of course, we did not do the show with Helmut Schmidt. Uh, there's Martin Ancelini behind that. But we put Helmut on top of that because that was the leadership in our country at that time. And when you're saying, you know, remembering times, not just for nostalgic reasons, but also really thinking about it, my upbringing on this five story, uh, by the way, no elevator walk up, 96 steps up and down grocery store down there. Um, we had a, you just did your Metro Grow show, great one, by the way. We had a Metro, you know, buy a farmer's market there. We had public transportation. We had everything. This was as sustainable as you can basically get it. And I remember that. And there's one important thing. This was a rental unit. By the time of the 80s, you know, my father thought he needed to buy a home. The whole mortgage thing started too. And it wasn't quite as relaxed. So we want to remember that. So Jimmy Carter, who was the president at that time, just an update on um, his uh, wife forever. Rosalind passed away in the uh, end of last year. He's still hanging in there. He has been in hospice for too long, longer than anyone is in hospice. And um, so he's hanging in there. And um, not that long ago here uh, at the end of last year, he was doing public appearance when Rosalind was still around and they had that, you know, peanut. He was a peanut farmer there. So that's about, but when you go around, it's really interesting, depending on who you ask. We did a show already when we thanked Jimmy for when he was going into hospice. And we're recalling this uh, Uber driver on the big island who when he, you know, we talked and he heard I'm an architect. He said, oh yeah, that's, that's like Jimmy. Jimmy actually built houses for Habitat for Humanity for little people here on my island. So while, yes, um, uh, he might not be remembered for having been as successful uh, during his presidency, but certainly post his presidency, he uh, there are certain things that we want to remember. And But we remember, Jay, through artifacts that are sort of little aids for zeitgeist, and architecture is one of them, but cars, for example. So why I'm so excited about is that I played with American cars by Gorgie Toys and Matchbox in the sandbox and immersed myself to really be in America with these. And I had this friend of mine uh, um, who was uh, three years older. He was from Hamburg. And he was um, I, in the last, in one of the last shows, I gave him credit. I called it a one hit wonder. I said, it's an all hit wonder or as an evergreen, the, the, the sound is called hold on. And I saw this on the island of Ibiza, it's been played around. So this is Stefan Severak. He got me excited about America 
about uh, and then another friend of mine we were in one of the shows i got to do a little correction here because his father was you mentioned panama he was the honorary consul of germany in panama and a banker and he drove a lincoln um you got to watch that show that we're show quoting here mobile and immobile and you get the whole so a correction it was a mark three gregor this is gregor to get records straight and why is this important again um, we were just discussing, Jay, when we were emailing each other, uh, someone said that R&B music and us listening to that in Germany was a kind of denazification because we didn't want to listen to German music anymore for obvious reasons. So American black music really helped us. This guy, by the way, was one of my you know, one of the vinyls that my wife just gave me a CD replacement because I have a CD player in my car. This is Maze and Frankie Beverly, one of the, uh, you know, band players just passed away. And then comes architecture, Jay. When I finally arrived in the, in the early 90s, I saw what is uh, a great example for what we just discussed, how one could look at America, that for example, modernism, some say, it was invented in Germany by the Bauhaus and others, but Americans took it on and brought it to a level that Germans, you know, for shooting themselves in their own foot, of course, with Hitler, uh, never allowed themselves to bring it. And after you freed us from that, um, we were so traumatized that modernism wasn't able to enjoy itself either. So as we talked about in these many shows, architecture in America, and this is my fa this is probably what had the most impact on me. This is I am pay again, but in the uh, in '76, it's a bank in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, it's you know I when I was a kid uh, and finally coming in my 20s, right? I wanted to have a piece of that America that I played with in the sandbox. So I bought myself a '72 Plymouth Fury, the big boat, and I drove it everywhere, and it never broke down. By the way, um, that was made to last, right? But it was from 72, so there was 73, the oil crisis. So I am paying 76. This is the most uh, decarbon, green, lead, sustainable building in Lincoln, Nebraska, because I am pay learned from it. As Jimmy Carter was asking the American people to say, take that you know, early, which was politically based and not resource based oil crisis, right, as something to basically really learn from and wake up. And then, Jay, as you just said, things are very, very complex and, and have multiple layers. So I did a little research on who was actually the design partner because I and Pei started out and then had his partners over the time. So I ended up being, you know, Pei, Cop, and Freed. So James Ingle Freed is another example that we as Americans got because of us Germans having screwed up. And he had a, he was a, he came from a German Jewish family and his family have left to escape that horror. And so we were blessed to have him here. And so this is the building and the top left show quote at the, you know, New Year's Eve show. We talked about it and it was, it was as heroic, Jay, as you never get it in Germany. I'm totally patriotic about it as you can get it. And it was this wide open space and no cubicles in there. In fact, pay one suit when they started to put cubicles in there. Look at the bottom right, courtesy of my buddy, Chris Ford, who recently went back. There's this hillbilly architectural firm who just totally butchered it and screwed it up with their stuff. I mean, you don't leave a fingerprint on, I mean, if you have silverware, right? You polish it all the time. You don't leave fingerprints on. This is another example of we don't even know our, our own. I mean, talking, making America great again, you don't even see the greatness of it back then. You start to ignore or to actually butcher it, like in that case, which is really sad. And it gets worse, unfortunately, because James Ingo, and he's, he's gone. So wherever he is, he um, did this here uh, in, uh, in the, when was it here? In the late 90s. So this was this was not like Ron Lindgren, right? Killingsworth, Lindgren, Stricker, and partner. They built from the Kahala Hilton here to the Ihilani uh, here, and they always stayed true to themselves, regardless changing zeitgeist, taste, political leaderships, where too many hang their, their flag in the wind. They never did that. That's where they're utmost heroes. And here already with my initial hero, um, you know, James Ingo, he turned to the bad side from a total modern 
to a postmodern, you see us up there, right? With a little more hair back then uh, when we were talking about uh, cynical classicism. And so that's really to, and here we go back to us, Jay. Even the few years, three years before you came, I am Pei, as we just taught us, was at the very beginning. He was a very young and upcoming and unknown architect that Jackie Kennedy had faith in and helped him significantly. We have an I am Pei from that early year. So it's not like we jump on a wagon train. Oh, this is a you know famous architect. Let's get him here, right? No, this is East West Center. This is unfortunately not my employer, UH, because this is the federal government, right? They stepped in at the basically heydays of you age and and went ahead just like like that like like uh like uh, jackie and saying hey let's make something really awesome really progressive how about that we have that is that widely known this building should be celebrated as our as our other capital it's not we keep talking about it all the time we every generation of students we introduce it they kindly give us tours up to these days is actually going to give the most dignity and decent housing to our emerging student generation. But it's not us as, as UH. We don't do that. We do stupid PPP pre three times public private partnership projects that are horrible, that go up left and right. So the federal government uh, basically stepped in and did things. And cars, yes, are other embodiments. This is all to provoke. And I'm, I'm, you know, worried that you're not jumping in. Obviously, I do a monologue, so I need you to interrupt me. But this car here, I already got myself in two very serious arguments with a German body and with an American body, because they say this was the most stupid car we ever made. I throw out it was not. It was the attempt of Americans to say, OK, we must try to get smaller, but we still want to use the width of our great you know, highways and interstates. So we try to do that. And the AMC Pacer was that attempt of Americans to say, you know, we, we try to you know, uh, scale down. And, and my little old uh, Renault, and this is, by the way, there was a partnership talking you know, immigrants and being cosmopolitan, right? You had the French car company Renault come and team up with GMC in the 70s to do a collaboration, intercultural, international collaboration. And that little Twingo that I have, which is in 96, you can see as a little baby, you know, outcome of that. How cool is that? And even cooler, Jimmy then in his time, uh, under his time, not him, but under his time, people put all these batteries into the AMC Pacer. So while Elon Musk, you know, claims to be the electric car, um, you know, inaugurator, he was not, we know that if we're smart enough. So here it was, and there's Ethel, our uh, longest um, um, uh, hotelier who runs the breakers, who uh, basically um, is proud of the Aloha movie because it was partly filmed in her hotel. And uh, I keep, you know, when she says, oh, and the Hawaiian community was kind of ticked off by it because Harleys play Hawaiians. And I said, give it time. Cameron Crowe, I, even I needed to watch that movie five times, for example, to understand that Billy Murray is depicting Elon Musk for Starlink. It's very, very cleverly done. If you haven't watched that, you should actually watch that. So what we encourage you here is to look at architecture as the embodiment of zeitgeist and the values behind. If you go to the big island, which we're doing here now, and you go up the Kona coast from the very top north to the south, you see the best of the days, the mid 60s, there was Mauna Kea Beach Hotel by Skidmore Owings Merrill, which by the way, we have one Skidmore Owings Merrill also as uh, the engineering building, which is just across from IMP, right? There was also an early 70s building. Then you had our great heroes of Killingsworth and Larry Stricker doing the Mauna Lani. He didn't have a Rockefeller budget, but still a pretty good one. That was from the, in, in the, in the mid 80s. Um, and then uh, you see me down there behind me, you see uh, the front desk lady, she's working there since day one. And she told me that uh, after that, which was um, um, uh, estimated a $90 million remodeling recently and ended up being a $200 million remodeling, 
uh, guests come back and they say, where is our hotel? Where's the jungle in the middle? Where's the waterfalls? They all took it out for novelty. So there we go again. We don't see our silverware. We don't see a killing's worth being, you know, a gem and a jewel. And you better touch it up lightly. So once again, you spend $200 million to basically, you know, make your silverware into plasticware that you coat with whatever fancy color. And to the left is then the last one chronologically, time chronologically, the most south is what's now the, the Hilton Waikoloa, where you see us where we went some years ago to check that out. And the top row is show quotes from cars. You can see that from that glorious Lincoln Continental that Kennedy three months before he got killed in it back in Texas, he drove through Waikiki. In the 80s, the town cars, you know, which in the Lincoln Lawyer depicted was sort of well, reaching its end of 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 lasting and long longevity. And the one that I had then after that, the early 90s, it was just nothing but junk and it basically fell apart. So we should really look at things um, as embodied zeitgeist. And that gets us to this very controversial gentleman here, uh, Chris Hammeter, who uh, you remember uh, in various ways. And uh, so what does he embody? He was the developer of the Hilton Waikoloa. And here are some pictures of how it looked like and it looks like. And they, uh, I think the New York Times depicted him as the synonym of opulence. He tried to, he was very ahead of the game for the 80s as everything was very flamboyant and, and out there. And certainly his uh, mid 70s Hyatt uh, Regency just here across from me was an example for, for that sort of a, a megalomanic approach. But me now on that street, this is what's happening. There is these, uh, um, you know, uh, fossil dinosaur concrete trucks driving by all the time, pouring concrete into this monster, which is the most recent developed in Waikiki. It is a timeshare for, for Marriott. And we had that on a show here, which was called Freescaping. And we analyzed and we said it's pretty much the same old fossil formalism. And the top left we want to return to, this is interesting. And I want to have your, it's your choice, Jay. We reached a half hour. You want to take on to produce more and go on a little bit, or you want to make a cut here. But I want to brief you on your very... A vivid uh, zeitgeist witness memories of the uh, King Village, which was the very first development by that Christopher Hemeter. How we want to go about it, Jay? Well, let's take a little more time. And uh, King's Alley, it was, and King's it was Alley. different than everything else in Waikiki. Um, it really gave me a rash to walk through it because, uh, as you said, uh, opulence, extravagance. And uh, in the view of many people, tasteless. But that's what he did. And, and um, you know, the bankers, uh, the capital concentrations, if I can use that term, they all backed him up. And so what you have is an expression of the certain group of influencers in King's Alley. It was not bound to last, Martin. It ultimately failed for a number of reasons. Among those reasons, aesthetics themselves. <clears throat> so I want to add one other thought before you resume, and that is this. <clears throat> we spoke about cultural uh, DNA. We talk about human DNA. Um, we talk about looking at a snapshot of zeitgeist and finding elements from the past all stranded together just like DNA. And I think we have to separate, you, you kind of included architecture in Zeitgeist. I would not. I would include architecture as a separate category. Architecture, Martin, you can quote me on this, has its own DNA. Why? Because it has its own group of influencers and they pass on the ideas, the architectural concepts from one generation to another. Uh, from Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, who did have a huge uh, influence on architecture going forward, to to many architects who have an influence going forward, but it's not the public, and it's not necessarily government. Although government, through the plan, the planning process, you know, has a a certain a certain control of that. It's the architects, and it's the bankers, 
And it's the capital concentrations who create architecture in a snapshot moment of zeitgeist. And so I say to you that we are in a constant evolution of architectural DNA. And everything we do has an effect, or perhaps doesn't, on the next evolution, the next generation. And I think you you will, if you think about it, you will agree with me. I, 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 I you can see it almost. It's, you know, gears are kicking in here like crazy. And before we leave this and pick up on that next week again, because we kind of cut the angle about Jimmy Carter and and why not just because he was stationed here in a submarine in a in a in a nuclear submarine and um, but but what is his architectural relationship and has to do with Hammerder? But before we leave, uh, I want to provoke you back, Jay, about your point so well taken about capital concentration. Of course, you have we call it clients, right? We have to have clients behind, and clients have the power because they have the budget and they have the money, right? And so, but this project here, I couldn't agree more with you as my, you know, my value system and being a modernist, I thought like using the other term kitschy, what a kitschy piece of crap this is, you know, and it's, it's all pastiche and it's falling apart. Well, as we say, um, often uh, you don't respect or value the things until they're gone. Now that the whole thing is gone, not only that I have construction noise, you know, all week around and, and heavy construction and sort of as uh, Avatar and James Cameron, you know, caused this the bridgehead city at the beginning of the movie where heavy stereotomic concrete pouring maybe isn't the way to build anymore. So that's what's going on. And I'm imagining the new one is going to be an exclusive timeshare uh, that is only for the people who can afford. Uh, there's going to be the first stories are going to be, guess what? Of course, parking, right? Although parking should be gone here for the longest time and she should all be walkable, Waikiki, right? And so what is coming up now, actually thinking about it, almost doesn't rehabilitate, but puts this in a bigger, in a different perspective because at least it was walkable, it was approachable. It actually had a farmer's market in there that I don't have anymore. It, I think it moved over to uh, Hammeter's Hyatt in the in the fake you know waterfall fountain around it. But I wit I remember this where we have trees, right? We see trees here. So if you strip it away from all the bad stuff, all the pastiche and all the fake, and it wanted to depict, by the way, um, you know, Kalakaua's old Hawaii go figure, and it's very Disney-ish, you know, as, as Hammerter's stuff is. But I want to say, I want to, you know, throw back and, uh, uh, you know, uh, deliver as food for thought, um, because it was the early 70s, 72 here, there was some um, um, reference to what we like to talk about. We will reconvene after our two sidetracking shows that we're into, and we want to go back to Barcelona, where it's all about public space and place, right? So relatively speaking, so what, to what we're getting next, which is this, which is just another double loaded corridor, high rise, oriented the wrong way. It's going to be blasted by the setting sun. It's only working through air conditioning. So it's fossil formalism. It's the aftermath and the legacy of Ronnie Reagan. And once again, almost ironically and cynically at the bottom left, you see right now this huge effort of, of, of pouring in, in, in place, this curviness in plan. And this is for the cars. And then they could have put some plans behind. So we had said, Cars get treated better than people here. I want to move into the parking plinth where I can actually live an easy breezy lifestyle while upstairs, you know, you're going to be microwaved. So again, um, you know, it's it's like in politics as well, right? Um, I caught you guys with, with, with Tim last time, uh, you know, with your Reagan movie that you got a little bit kind of nostalgic about things and... And if you look at Trump and and everything, you know, that makes Reagan look a lot better. And I think the same is for this project here, I feel like, 
that the new one is so much worse than it actually, yes, it rehabilitates the project that was yet, you know, probably driven by questionable, greedy capitalist, you know, motivations. I would like to thank you, Martin, for covering huge swaths of ground uh, in, in every field of endeavor and trying to integrate all these uh, strands of influence and um, execution. The fundamental point is that, I hope you quote me on this, architecture is where we live. And it's really important. That was the perfect closing note for now. But we pick it up confrontationally and a decent way next week. See you all back for then. Look forward to Jay. Mm -hmm.